All right, um, welcome. Um, right, so I, I, I want this to be a really informal event, right? So I'm, I'm not, we're not going to do an hour and a half of PowerPoint. I've only got like 20 odd slides. And then we're going to like get our hands dirty and we're going to um, do some stuff, demigods permitting. Um, and if you've got a laptop with you, then you're welcome to follow along, join in, do it yourself, like, you know, and then you. Um, the Wi-Fi password is redbudget2014 with a capital R and a capital B. Um, so, yeah, join in. Um, okay, so we've been doing this, um, how do I even advance this? We've been doing this, you can't see it because it's under the stupid thing, how to series with a couple of webinars and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're thinking about doing a webinar on my platforms as well, which would be a condensed version of this. But um, yeah, this is what we're doing. So this is me. This is where I came from. Um, and not, well, it's not a printer. Who knows what that is? Who knows what it is? Yes, oh, Dave knows. It's a, it's a CDC hard drive. Um, and when I started, my first job in computers was as an operator of these things. Um, and that, like, that's got eight platters on the top there, so that might be like, might be 80 meg, but the, it could, could easily be 40 meg, I can't even remember, not much. And you, there's a big button on the front, you have to spin it up. Right, first of all, you lift the, spin it down, you lift the lid, put the plastic cover over, twist it on, take it off, put it, on, and then put the new one in, untwist the cover, take it off, put the lid down, spot, start it up, wait for it to spin up. And then it would come online and it was like 40 meg and it was like, whoa. Um, I'm showing it because um, it's part of history and it's quite cool. But also because like I started as a operator, computer operator, so that's where I come from. Um, and then I went on to do a year and a half of COBOL and then I went, went to work for a company called um, Data General and they had this fantastic thing called DGUX, which was like Unix, and I was like, whoa, this is brilliant. Um, played with it before at university, but um, that's the X Windows thing. And you know, Unix hasn't really changed very much in all, all those years. I mean, it's pretty much exactly the same as it was, which is phenomenal, right? Like, it was amazingly well designed and developed, and, um, and it stood the test of time. The Unix philosophy we're going to read about, if you don't know about it already, is just like stunning. So, um, that, so I did like loads of Unix and loads of operations stuff, Perl, you know, like incredibly powerful language for orchestrating stuff. And then somebody in 1994 introduced Mosaic to me um, and I remember going to University of Hawaii um, on, in Mosaic and I could see photos from their com of the student common room like re re being refreshed every minute and I was like oh my god oh my god this is amazing <laughs> and you could just feel that it was going to be like enormous and then that, that's basically been my life ever since um, but in 2004 I worked for London Underground and um, we built this thing called Trackinet so this is like on I don't know i5 probably or something ridiculous um, SVG on a canvas um, with all the trains, um, so there's a train here, the head of it, the 006, and the head 102 and 106, and these are the platforms, the stations, and then you can see the signals and they change, they go red and green, and then the points flip over as well, so you can, um, you can see where any of the trains were on the network, um, all done with JavaScript, I don't know how we did it on such rubbish browsers, but like processing like 37,000 messages per second, filtering them all out and you know, storing them and all that sort of stuff. And then in 2005, on the 7th of July, um, there was four trains that were exploded by bombs and the police were all over us. Like, because it, up in this top, you see it says live there, and there's a zoom, but it says live. There's also had a recording capability. This picture might have been taken before that was introduced. I don't know. Um, so you could rewind it and play where the trains, tra play back where the trains were, which was used by drivers who passed signals at danger. They called them SPADs, S-P-A-D, signal passed at danger. 
Um, and if the driver went past, they would go get tracking it out and they'd rewind it and they'd say, look, look, the signal was green and you went through it. Um, or red, I'm sorry. Um, so the police came and they took it and they commandeered all our servers and took them all away and we had to build the whole thing again from scratch. And the, the reason they took them away is because they wanted to reuse, preserve all the data for forensic analysis and, uh, well, I guess whatever, um, and play it back. And when they were playing it back, they noticed that all four trains had passed through King's Cross Station at the same time. And that was how they knew to focus on King's Cross with all the CCTV footage, which is how they found, the, found what had happened, uh, which is quite cool. But um, rebuilding this after the police took all our servers away was a nightmare, right? It was a mission because that was 2004. And we can do a lot better than that now, like a lot, lot better. Um, and we could have, um, you know, we could get new applications up and running in seconds, potentially, instead of the days that it took us. So, probably even weeks, actually. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, then I went to work at Conchango, um, and that was the birthplace of, whole, of Agile for me, and um, Lean Agile, especially. Um, and has influenced Red Badger. Um, and there's about six or seven companies that were born out of the Conchango stable after EMC bought them. They also bought Data General, who is also used to work with before. They've been bitten twice by the little buggers. Um, the Evil Machine Corporation. And so um, they trashed Conchango, and, but some great things have come out of it. Um, so here we are, that's me in the middle. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not a very good. Uh, likeness. Anyway, onto micro platforms. So, just some interesting things because, like, our history is so important um, with DevOps. Like, I started as an operator and did a load of dev. So, like, what is DevOps? Is it operators doing dev or is it dev doing ops? What is it? Um, we'll talk about it a bit more in a while because it's quite an interesting thing to think about. So, if you Google micro platforms today, uh, <laughs> this is what you get. Um, well, I actually also um, got like this ladder from BNQ that folds into sort of like platforms that you can paint the ceiling. Um, is that in the box? <laughs> so yeah, it could be. So yeah, so basically, it's not. This is some. This is not. I'm not trying to coin a term here, but I'm just saying like you won't find much out there. But and, and that's because it isn't really a thing. What you all here on false pretenses, um, it's not really a thing. But this potentially could be, right? So this is Victor's cringe. Yeah, it's like cringe alarms are going off. Um, the mm, stack, right? One of those M's. <laughs> one of those M's is uh, micro platforms, obviously. Um, we we'll look at what the others are, and actually, what, when when we bring them all together certain things happen which are quite interesting and that's really what this is about because the rest of it isn't new um, as such. Um, I thought that our Bisto advert was mm, Bisto but it's actually our Bisto otherwise I would have called it the gravy stack or <laughs> something like that. Anyway, so this is it. Um, deploy a microservices application as though it was a monolith from a mono repo to a micro platform. And this is where the magic starts to happen. So we're going to look at what all these things are, um, probably know already, um, and why the combination is important. I've written a blog post about it as well, you can read that. Um, so microservices applications. <coughs> we used to build these things. We used to build big monoliths, right? Massive, great, big enormous things that you, were really, really difficult to, um, to deploy, um, fix, maintain. maintain, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was scale, scale yeah. Um, but there were some benefits to them in, that, in the fact that they were, you know, they were when they were deployed. They were deployed as a thing, and they were a thing, and they were tested as a thing, and delivered as a thing, um, and that's actually quite a useful thing. Like at the moment, we've like we we 
doing all these like microservices and you can get so many of them and they're all at different versions and each one's this thing on its own right. Um, and that's good because it enables this evolutionary architecture. Each one of those microservices can evolve on its own roadmap and can um, be replaced and updated and whatever, um, independently of everything else. But they still have to talk to each other. They're not like really independent. The bounded context of the microservice is great because that keeps everything in one place, like often along domain boundaries. And I often think that a microservice should, microservice should be about the size that one person can hold in their head. So that, and that's a good thing because a, a team that's looking after building a, build a microservice can like focus on what it does and make sure it does it really, really well and pro provide its, um, its API as a product um, with attention to developer experience and consumers and all that sort of stuff, product owners, all that, you know, as though it was a UI, but it's like an API, but it's a thing and it's manageable and it can um, evolve on its own. But the problem arises when you need to talk to other microservices in your application and you've got to make sure that the microservice is at the right version, that it's compatible and that, you know, what happens if it's not there, you know, all these things. Um, and large applications today, you know, they may well have been like that before and impossible to, to, to manage, but, you know, inside that, still modules and you know you can still kind of you still do it right um, and so I kind of like want I'm not saying we should go back to my monoliths but I think we want to get the benefits of some of some of those so that we can manage our microservices a bit better um, one of the problems biggest problems that developers have when they're putting applications together that are orchestrations of microservices is um, versioning and like how do you make sure that you're not talking to a service that's out of date and what happens when you want to update the client side but not the server side, all those breaking changes, all that sort of stuff. And so Semver, which is underneath that stupid icon I can't get rid of, um, is all about major, minor and patch or um, semantically breaking feature and fix. So the rule that you're supposed to follow is that if you break if you break a contract between a client, a consumer and a producer, um, whether that's an API, a public API ac across the network or whether it, whatever it is, um, it's an, a major increment. Um, if it's just a new feature that doesn't break any existing stuff and it's a minor, and then if it's just a bug fix, it's a patch. And it kind of works ish if you remember to do it and if, if, you, if you can rely on the person having done it properly um, but it still results in like having multiple versions and you know RESTful APIs and stuff v, slash v1 slash v2 slash v3 and you've got like all these microservices all different versions all supporting different clients potentially from different applications and it can soon get into a, a real mess. Um, one of my heroes I think Rich Hickey um, author of Closure, um, this great talk speculation, if you haven't watched it you have to. He rants against Semver and says actually this is really rubbish and there are better ways of doing, this, doing these things. And if you make a breaking change then it's a new thing, right, call it something different, it's a new thing, it's not what it was. Um, and instead try and evolve your thing, whatever it is. Um, by only adding to it, like require less and what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Less and, and give more or something, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, um, just by adding stuff to the APIs, you can make, you can carry on for quite a long time with that. But eventually you kind of think, well, we need to do all this, all, all this whole thing again and redesign it from scratch. So let's, now it's a new thing. So that's what Richard Key suggests and that, that this summer thing is rubbish. Um, he actually jokes about the fact that the spe Semver specification is itself versioned, which is kind of a little bit, just, <laughs> a bit weird. Um, okay, monorepo. So this, this, this is something that a lot of big companies do. 
Apple do it, Google do it, right, everyone does it, where they put all of their code base into one giant repository, all in directories at the top level next to each other, instead of having lots of separate. So you'd think that like, if you're having a microservice and you've got a team looking after it, then it could have its own repository and it'd be fine. Um, got some there to control the API with everything else, and you can, you can live like that, and you can. Um, but what happens when you put them all in together into one repository is you get this capability of doing atomic commits across all the services in the application. So here we've got on the left, we've got a web server, maybe a gateway or a token exchange or something, I don't know, whatever it is, an experience API, some process API, some system APIs, or whatever you've got, whatever the structure looks like, doesn't matter. And they're all sitting next to each other um, at the top level in this repository and the SHA, um, the commit SHA, which is on the left hand side, um, is the effectively the, I don't know, what is it, it's the, it's a, effectively a content based address of everything that, and that's underneath it. So if anything changes that has to change, right, it's a, it's a new version number, it's a version number that can replace Semba so a major minor patch, just use that char. So that uh, current right now, that would be DB77FU9, but two weeks ago it might have been 986. The point is that that version number represents all the services, um, all the components of the application in the, as they were at the point they were committed um, by the developer, so they were designed to work together. And if we carry that SHA through, that version, that mono version, or whatever we want to call it, through, then we can test it with all the things in the, you know, designed to work together. So they're tested together. They can be deployed together. They can be managed together as though they were a monolith, right? So there might be two applications or five applications or whatever in this mono repo. Maybe one of them is the web the gateway one of the process APIs and system API, and maybe the other one's just an API and it's whatever. Um, it doesn't matter, you pick the services that you want from the monorepo, assemble your application, um, and the version, you can take any of those commit shards and you know that they'll all work together at that point. Um, so that's, that's really important because now all of a sudden we don't have to worry about versioning. Versioning has just gone out the window. We've just got one version that we have to care about and that's all, the, all there is. And we can treat the whole thing as though it was a collection of services at the same, at the same uh, version number, which is great. So this thing down the right. So that's some commits to a pull request and this is the number, the short SHA. What does SHA stand for, Louis? Not listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> what what does SHA stand for? <laughs> Simple hash algorithm. Secure hash algorithm. What's that? Sam's hash algorithm is stupendous. <laughs> <laughs> Super hash algorithm. Um, this is really silly because you can't see it. So, um, but what it is is a compose file. I'm going to open up a compose file um, so that we can see it big. Um, From what to what? From this to. How do, how do you even do that? <laughs> how do you even do that? Themes? Themes? Yeah. One dark, one light? One light yeah. Syntax theme, one light as well? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Jeez. I love that. <laughs> Everyone's saying you should use VS Code now. Ooh. Ooh. It's very difficult to change the CSS. Yeah. Um, right now, now you've completely thrown me. I have no idea where. <laughs> One of these is uh, that thing. Obviously not. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Great. Okay. This is um, a Docker Compose file. Like, who who knows Docker? Who's used Docker? Who's got Docker containers in production. 
Um, who, who's used Docker Compose? Who's used Docker Stack, uh, like Docker Swarm in Swarm mode? Okay. Okay, cool. All right, great. All right, just so, so this is um, version 3.1 of the Docker Compose specification, which says, which allows us to add extra bits, which we'll come on to later. But the main, the important thing about this is that this is our collection of services, proxy, web, gateway, API, some secrets and some networks, but ignore that. Four services, um, and they, they're all going to get tagged with the same tag, which is going to be the SHA. We'll, we'll see that in a second. Um, but they're all at the same version because they've all been pulled from the monorepo um, because we, we know they work together. And we're going to deploy, we're going to use this Compose file as a description of what the orchestration of microservices should be, um, what images should use, um, what directory we're going to build it from, um, what port it's going to expose, where the upstream services are, what network it's going to sit on, how many replicas in our, in our cluster we're going to need, um, when we update them, how many we update at a time, and what's the, de de the delay between those updates, um, how we restart, and where we want them to be placed. And that's pretty much it. And the web has got a similar sort of thing, and this gateway, which is token exchange thing, and the API is the same. And we've got some secrets which we'll look at. So, um, everything about my application, the orchestration of those services described in this file, and we can use it to build the application, we can use it to push the application to a registry, we can use it to deploy the application to any number of um, platforms, identical platforms. Um, and so we've got, we've got now some way of bringing all these things together. So Docker in Swarm mode, um, there used to be a thing called Docker Swarm, which was a separate thing altogether. Um, Docker brought that into the core engine last summer um, and called it Docker in Swarm mode. I think since 112 onwards, we're now like way past that. Um, but effectively, it's just a way of um, making a whole load of machines running Docker look like one machine running Docker. So it takes away the scalability problem for us so we can have as many containers as we want running spread across these machines. It decides where it puts them. You've got some control over that. Um, but effectively, there are some managers and some workers and you can, you can have like one, three, five, seven, nine managers. An odd number is good because it ha they have to have consensus and agree on what's happening in the swarm. Um, they, if we've got three, we can lose one without any effect. If we've got five, we can lose two, maybe one planned, one unplanned. Um, and we can recover, just, we can just bring another one in and it'll just all sort itself out. With the workers, we can have any, any number of workers from like one to a thousand, whatever. So these are virtual machines in AWS or something like that um, that don't have anything installed on them apart from the Docker engine. Um, we're going to play with this, actually. Um, what, I'm going to start something off because it takes a while. So um, I've cleaned my machine out. Um, there's nothing um, existing on it. But um, there's an app. OK, so there's a open source repository called Stack uh, in the Red Badger um, organization, which has got um, some examples and some tooling around managing um, clusters of microservices, of microservices, including some really nice stuff, and it's all good get, get, getting you going. So we're going to use that as an example. I'm just going to kick off, and we're going to go back and talk about it in more detail. But I'm just going to kick off. Um, is that big enough? Is it big enough? Yeah. Um, kick off the creation. So what I've got VirtualBox installed on here somewhere. Um, and in there, I've got, um, here we go. So this is just some script automation for creating like four virtual machines um, in VirtualBox. And it's going to take a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to leave it running. In the meantime, we'll go back to talking about 
clusters and why. Um, so we've talked about what a little bit. We haven't really talked about why. And I think underneath there is a CI, CD, CDP. And then you could have another CI, continuous improvement, but the Japanese word for that is Kaizen. Um, everything, I think, these days should be around how to enable continuous deployment into production. And everything should support that. We should be able to get software deployed instantly, hundreds of times a day potentially, um, a constant trickle of little tiny features, not even features necessarily, just changes into production. In order to do this, we have to separate deployment and releases. Um, maybe the releases are behind feature flags. Um, it's a whole culture change. Enterprise architecture often gets in the way. We need to change that and make it more evolutionary. Um, <coughs> but this is the fastest way of getting stuff into production is to do continuous deployment to production. It's the lowest risk um, because as the time between deployments tends towards zero, the amount of change in that deployment tends towards zero and the risk associated with deploying it tends towards zero. It's the easiest way to get the highest quality of software because we're on it all the time. We can fix forward, we don't have to roll back because fixing forward is easy. So we can constantly be making tiny little adjustments um, based on the information that we have in our heads at the time. When it's a big release, it's like three months since you know, the last release. Nobody can remember what went in there three months ago. It's like, and if there's a bug, where do you look? You've got all this whole space to look in. Whereas if the deployment was only five minutes ago, when we know exactly what the change was, so we know we can see exactly where the bug is and we can find it. And so it's the best way to get the highest quality. Also the lowest cost way of, developing, of releasing, so delivering software, the way to get the highest velocity in your teams and crucially, <laughs> the happiest teams. Um, it's a no brainer. I don't understand why organizations find it so difficult. But I think, I think it's because um, they kind of have to let go a little bit, or <laughs> well, they feel like they have to let go a little bit. So, um, so we'll see where it goes. But I think, you know, everybody, if most, a lot of people are doing this now, everybody will be doing it in like a couple of years. Um, and the goal is to get the smallest possible mean time to recovery. So if we, um, if this stuff does go wrong, we can fix it really quickly. And that's like a really good, that's really good on your risk profile if you can get. Um, the Google site reliability engineering stuff talks about error budgets, which is one minus the service level objective. So if, you're, if, you're, if your objective is to be up for like 99.9% .9 of the time, then your error budget is 0.1. And once you've exceeded your error budget, you can't deploy any new features um, or release any new features. The only deployments you can do are around refactoring and making it more stable and more reliable and in, in improving the quality um, of what we're doing. So there's a whole raft of things that have to be true in order to support continuous delivery into deployment into production, but um, it is the safest way of doing it. And I think this, this stuff that we're, going, we're looking at today helps with this like massively. Why also, um, if you've got shared platforms or if you've got like um, solution teams that everybody relies on, as, those, as, as, this, as you scale, the number of dependencies like between them um, in, like grows um, astronomically and that's what kills us. So actually it's really good to be autonomous. Everyone's seen this from the Spotify model um, about aligned autonomy. Like let's, get, let's empower our teams, our cross-functional teams to be able to own their product from cradle to grave to be responsible for the choices of how it's built, how it's managed, how it's run, how it's tested, how it's designed, you know, everything, 24 seven run, um, everything. So if they, if they own that and they can fix anything, they're not dependent on anyone else and you don't get this problem, but also um, they feel empowered and they do a better job basically and they're happier and they want to do it. I'm probably talking to the converted. Um, so in order to do this, you have to do everything as code, right? In order to do continuous deployment, everything has to be automated because by definition, you can't have any humans involved. Continuous delivery has humans as a gate before production. And a human would say, yeah, that goes into production or no, it doesn't. 
and continuous deployment into production, every single push to every single merge into the master branch will end up in production if it gets through, if it gets that far um, automatically. So the application obviously is code, the tests are code, the pipeline is code, um, it, platform is built with immutable infrastructure as code, we've got our containers as code, and we'll look at Docfile in a minute if you haven't seen one, but you probably have, and service orchestration as code like the compose file that we did look at. It's all code, it's all in our repository, in our mono repo, along with everything else. So any changes to the infrastructure, any changes to the platform, any changes to the way the application is orchestrated, any of those changes all um, get committed into the, into the repository, along with the code. Everything's in sync. There's one version across everything. Really easy. Um, and so any possible change whatsoever is a code change. We're not allowed to make any direct changes on any platform, on any infrastructure. You can't make any configuration change yourself. If a human makes a manual change to something, then the knowledge that's involved in that change is in his head or her head, um, and after the event is lost. If it's in the code, it's recorded, it can be built on, it can be evolved, um, and it can help people in the future. And it gives us stability and reliability as well. All this will help with governance. Um, and yeah, the cap knowledge capture thing. I don't know what the next slide is. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, in order to um, support continuous deployment into production, we need like T-shaped developers or DevOps-focused teams. And this is a whole, where the whole conversation earlier was going um, with DevOps. Is it devs doing ops, ops doing devs? It's a culture. It's a thing, it's not a thing really, it's just a, um, and this T-shape, pie-shape, comb shape thing which you've all probably seen before, T-shape where you've got a speciality in one and broad knowledge of lots of things, pie-shape where you've got a speciality in one and broad knowledge of lots of things and potentially learning a new thing or maybe it's a second speciality and comb shape where you're like constantly evolving your, well being specialists in multiple things, polyglot developers, um, people that, um, understand how to um, code inside an application and outside an application um, on the server and find their way around a server and build stuff, put stuff together. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential. Okay, we'll come back to that. I'm bored now. Um, <laughs> right. There's, um, okay, so what happened here um, was that we built four virtual machines, one, two, three, Four. One's, one's a manager and then there's three, three workers. Um, then, then what we did was, so this is, this is creating Docker machine number one. Then we did a Docker swarm in it. We told it what? Address to advertise on. Can you read this? No. It's not highlighting very well, is it? If I go bigger, shall I actually get rid of this one? And then go like that. Is that better? Yeah. Um, and then on the other machines, on the worker machines, um, oh, so on the manager machine, we initialized a swarm and it gave us back this to so say, if you want to join this swarm, use this swarm token and just issue this command. Um, and then so on, it's exactly what we did on worker one here, where we issued that, um, so we used the Docker client to talk to this host, which is the manager, um, and said swarm join with that token. Um, and then that was, the command from up there. So now this worker is part of the swarm. And then we did the same for two and the same for three. And then we asked Docker Machine to list the boxes so we can see that we've got manager one, worker one, worker two, worker three. And then we asked Docker um, to list out the nodes in the swarm. And we can see that we've got one manager, which is the leader. If we had two or three, then they would just say reachable, but, um, but they wouldn't be the leader. You need one leader. Um, and then some worker nodes. So that's it, we've got a swarm, that's all there is to it. I can um, deploy stuff to that swarm now um, and look at it. So let's, let's have a look at Red Budget Stack. In the readme here, um, this, this readme, you can follow it through. So this was the script that we just ran, which provisioned the three workers. Um, in front of the swarm, we need a bunch of services to help us. 
work with the Swarm. So I've got a DNS server here that just resolves names so I can type them in the web browser. Um, we've got a, a local registry and actually a registry mirror of, a, of the public registry to save bandwidth and speed things up. I've got a load balancer sitting in front of the Swarm which is direct traffic across and balance it across all the nodes in the Swarm. Um, and then and then we've got some, an application that we can deploy to it. So if I, um, if I uh, set up the DNS server, which is just um, DNS mask running inside of containers, that's that done. Um, set up a load balancer. This queries the, the IP addresses of the swarm and, that, and sets up a load balancer in front of the um, thing. And then the registry, which sets up uh, a registry, local registry, a registry mirror, and and puts an ambassador onto the swarm so we can get to it easily. Um, so now we can start deploying our application to it. So if we, um, it also in, in here we've got some tooling, this configure utility, which we're improving at the moment, but we can, um, we saw what that app, that app dot, um, YAML file looked like. Um, which lists out uh, all the things. It, it needs to know where the registry is and it needs a tag. It's gonna, if we don't supply a tag, it's going to pick it up from the current git commit. So if I build this application um, with configure lib index and then build app, um, now that was quite fast because it's using cached Docker layers from previous builds that have been done on this machine. It would take a little bit longer than that if it was, but say the web here, Node 6 Alpine adds this tiny init system in curl, um, sets an endpoint work directory, effectively copies up with the application, and then it builds the application. Um, it would run unit tests at this point as well, um, sets a health check on it so that the swarm can see whether it's healthy or not. Um, the user and basically that's it. Um, but all those cached versions, of it's just run through and cached it. But you can see also that it's tagged it with the registry and here the GitHub, the Git SHA. I don't know if you can see that. Let's move it. Let's look at one here. And they're all the same. Um, they've all been tagged with this mono version from the mono repo because they all sit next to each other. So if we actually look at that directory example. We'll see that um, this is effective, effectively mono, a mono repo. We've got our API, our gateway, our reverse proxy, and our web all sitting next to each other, um, rather than in separate separate repos. Um, so the commit version is what we want, um, and then so after successfully successfully built, it also tagged it. So the next thing we want to do is push our app to a registry. Um, so that was quick as well because it's already in the registry um, because it's been pushed before and nothing had changed. Um, and now we're going to deploy it. Um, and actually we're going to update the load balancer because there'll be new services and we want, to, want them to know. Oh, look at that. Um, this is because I'm going to run that registry script again. Why can't it find it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to, there's there's a there's a services app in here, and that that's got a visualizer in it, which we can deploy. Um, to the swarm, and that will actually help us see what's going on. If we um, if we do a, oh yeah, it's going in there. If we do a, um, if we point everything to the swarm, and then do a Docker node ls, we'll see the four nodes. And if we do a Docker um, service ls, we'll see the services. So so far, that was the visualizer we've just put in. It's, there's one out of one instance running. So it's on port 8000. Um, and then this is the registry ambassador that just effectively routes traffic out to the registry, which is outside. So now we should be able to go, we've got a DNS server. So if we go to V3, 
visualizer.services.local. Ah, why does nothing work when I want it to? Hmm. Um, sorry about this. This is why doing a live demo is never a good idea. Hmm. Okay. What? What? Okay. Let's let's clean up the um, local stuff. Provisioning OS ten. Clean. Clean up. Local. And then run the DNS again. And the load balancer again, and the uh, registry again. So the reason why we've got these things is because normally, if you had a plat micro platform in the cloud, the cloud you know, AWS would provide a lot of that stuff for you. So you'd have application load balancers instead of load balancer here. We'd have Route 53 instead of a DNS server here, um, and we would have ECI instead of a local registry. So what we're doing is we're just kind of replicating that. That, those features from the cloud locally so that we've got some supporting infrastructure for this locally. Um, right, it's got to work next time, right? So, visualizer. Hey, what was it? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's what happens when you're trying to do them, all right? So, these are our four servers um, the manager, which is the leader, and the worker, and worker, and worker. Victor wrote this um, visualizer in Elm. And um, it works really, really well. Um, when we put the app in here, we'll see that the networking um, is all displayed down the left here, which is really good as well. So let's deploy. Well, we're having problems deploying our app. Maybe it'll come back now the registry's there. Here we go. Right. There was something wrong with our registry. Maybe the order of things weren't written. I don't know. Um, excuse me. So it's, what it's doing now is it's. On, on the swarm, it's pulling those images from the registry, and you can see they're all at the same version number down here. Vitally important. Um, and then this section here, resolving. So what it does is, um, and then this is deploying. We'll come back to the resolve in a second. Um, in the compose file, in the app.yaml, um, we said we wanted two instances of each service. We might have some of these might stop and start. That proxy keeps bouncing at the moment because the API behind it isn't up, so it can't actually start. Right. We could fix that. So now the API is up. These proxies should stay up. There we go, and then eventually they should all come up and it should all be stable. And we should be able to. Uh, we should already be able to. Um, Go to web.app.local and see our application. Wow, geez. So this isn't a very interesting application, right? It, all it does, it's, it's um, an isomorphic React application running uh, under uh, Next.js. So this is server render, and that's the container that rendered it. Um, if I go back here now, this is rendered by the client. This is a, so it's an isomorphic application. So if you if you're just moving around, you're going to do all that client side. If I refresh this, then now it's rendered by the server again. So any page can be rendered by the client or by the server. Um, if it's rendered by the client, then it's an a API call from the browser to the API. Um, and this is the networking on the left. So in the, in the compose file, we said what networks we wanted them to belong to. Um, so this reverse proxy here is on the um, ingress network. That's got its port exposed. Let's look at this in the compose file at the same time. I think it's worthwhile. Reverse proxy. It's got a port. Sorry, not that. Um, OK, this is added later by the deployment stuff, because what the deployment tooling does is it scans the, the swarm to find available ports and then merges that in with the compose file so that when it deploys, it deploys it to a port that's not, that's not already taken. Um, so if we have a look at um, the sorry, configure example, if we have a look at these. Um, so this is the original app.yaml, and it needs the registry replacing and the tag replacing for all the images. 
Um, so that's done here. The order's changed because of the way that Docker Compose does this. But um, we should be able to see that the images have got the registry in, put in and the, and the tag. Then we resolve those. And when we resolve them, we resolve them to a content-based hash. And that means that when we actually deploy it, it won't redeploy something that hasn't changed. Um, so the, the actual bytes in the image have to have changed in order for it to be redeployed. Um, and then these are the ports. So the app is on 8001 and this on 8000. Because we've exposed those ports, um, we've told it all what we want, what services we want to expose, um, and where we want to expose them in this stacks YAML. Um, and because we've exposed those ports, we've got this little white dot on the outside saying um, traffic can come in here. Um, then it can go through, through this application and, and the application can also talk on this network and then it can, so it can talk to the web and it can talk to the um, gateway and the gateway can talk to the API. So if you're coming in from outside and you want to talk to the API, you've got to go through the reverse proxy and the gateway, which should probably do some token exchange um, and hit the API. If you're going to the web, you have to come in through the reverse proxy and then you can get to the web that way. Um, so that's quite interesting that you can get like internal overlay networking within the swarm um, to isolate um, the containers from being able to access the ones they shouldn't be able to access um, and to basically increase the security of the overall application. Um, and we've got two um, instances of each one running. If we take um, one of those out, so let's take out worker two, if I just pause that for a second. Um, then the swarm will eventually notice that it's not there anymore and it will move the, its workload onto the remaining servers. Uh, there we go. So it's gone red, it's gone down um, and it's moved what was running on there, those three services, onto those other nodes. Um, and it, the other services are still taking, you know, so there's zero downtime involved in that. Um, nobody noticed that it even happened. Um, apart from us. Um, if I bring that server back in again, by unpausing it, this, there we go, it's seen it again now. Um, and it should clear down. Um, so now we've got a fresh server that's waiting for um, scheduling. If, if these worker one and worker three were heavily loaded as a result of that machine going down, then it would probably try and reschedule again, but we can force it um, to, so if we do a docker um, service update, force update, and the name of the service, I don't know, um, reverse proxy for instance. Um, so that's now re rebalancing effectively onto the new node. Um, there we go. And we could force update all of them and it would just rebalance them. But you don't need to and it, it doesn't see a need to do it, so we probably don't either, right? Um, is there anything else to show on this? Can't make you need to, do you need to force it? So if you have this worker two waiting there without doing anything, just waste of resources, isn't it? Say again, so if, if it's a waste of resources just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. So well, the whole load? so I think it's it's scheduling algorithms known only to itself, but I think um, I think it probably thinks there's no point. It doesn't think anything, right? But it's probably programmed to to um, to not disrupt running services unless it needs to. So if if these servers are overloaded um, as a result of it, then yeah, it'll reschedule them. But if it's not, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter which service, as long as there's capacity on those machines. Um, if, you're not, if you're not hitting the capacity of all the other workers, you're just going to decrease the performance by transition the other ones because you're going to lose all your caches. So there's not actually an advantage in moving these across. Um, Temporarily, you'd lose a container. So you'd lose a container, so you've gone down, you go down to half capacity effectively um, in this instance. In a real running production application, you might have like loads of these, and you might not notice it. And re maybe maybe rebalancing is something you want to do. You can do it, but it doesn't do it automatically. Um, so 
we've got our application and we've got our, our um, why can't I see it now? I'll give up. Um, and our visualizer um, running on a swarm locally. Um, we could um, do that in AWS as well. One of the advantages of a micro platform is that it's portable. You know, all it needs is a bunch of VMs running Docker, so you can run them on a laptop in a data center somewhere in any cloud provider. There's nothing that ties you to any particular cloud provider, so you, you can move around between them. If portable, you can run them anywhere. Um, so also in this stack repository, we've got um, a whole load of provisioning scripts for doing an AWS, which is actually quite good fun, so we could do a bit of that. I'm conscious that we probably should get a drink, or should we carry on? Votes for drink, votes for carry on. Carry on, right. <laughs> Both, yeah, actually, good idea. Both, that works. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, right, so. Um, before we do, let's talk about some other um, important things. Um, so. These apps are 12 factor apps, um, which you probably all know about 12 factors, right? These 12 things that makes applications um, portable. Um, one of them is that they, the configuration comes from the environment, um, which is number three. Um, and there's a whole like e export services via port bindings. Are we doing that? Uh, basically, all of those 12 factors are being adhered to by a, by the concept of the swarm itself and all, and the application that's running in it, that makes it really really portable. So in that app YAML um, here, this is this is all the configuration this ha application has. I know it's a simple noddy application, but this reverse proxy needs to talk to the web host and the API host. It talks to the web host at web port 3000 and that's called web because this service is called web and there was internal service discovery within the swarm um, that ports 3000 because this is listening on 3000 and that's the the only configuration it needs to find its upstream services so we could change this to 3001 and that to 3001 and everything would still work so and that goes bad at Yeah, this, the service discovery within the swarm is DNS based and virtual IP based. So the DNS results to a virtual IP address which gets routed on the network layer to um, like round robin around the available services that supply it. So you've got internal load balancing with this within the swarm, you've got um, service discovery within the swarm. So I guess what this means is that the the configuration is reduced to almost nothing. Like we've all seen applications where there's like this much configuration, and it's different for every single environment. And like this service is here, this service is here, this service is here, and then this is the pre-prod one, this is the production one. And actually, if there's a bug in one of those configuration files, you probably won't find it until you get to that environment, right? Which um, is a bit unfortunate. Um, so th this just has one configuration. There's only one configuration, and this is it. There's some environment variables and some service discovery. Um, and that's about it. Um, if there were upstream external services, then we, we need a bit extra, and real, real world applications have a little bit more. But the point is that um, all the configuration is inside the environment variables, um, and, it, and it's, it doesn't change from one environment to another. So this, this app.yaml can deploy this orchestration of services to any environment, to development environment on my laptop to pre-production to production even and the configuration is exactly the same. Ultimately it is going to have to talk to different back-end services um, and you could have there's a bunch of different ways of doing that like with ambassadors or something that are in a known place or using external service discovery or DNS names or whatever but um, effectively what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of configuration so that and keep it the same in every environment um, and 12 factor apps help us do that. We looked at idempotent build, idempotent push, and idempotent deploy. Um, the build is idempotent because the local Docker cache has cache of layers that, that haven't changed, and if it hasn't, if 
you know, if the inputs to the layer haven't changed, the output can't be either, and it'll just use the cache one and run through it. So only the layers, the later layers um, that have changed will get rebuilt. The pushes are important because only the layers that have changed will actually get pushed to the registry because it has those, some of those layers already, and maybe two containers share a load of base layers, and then they only differ in the um, base layers, and they only differ at the top. Um, idempotent deploy we looked at because we resolved the tag um, so even though the tag is changing, we resolve that tag um, against a content hash, a digest effectively of the image itself, which is another SHA um, that doesn't change. So two versions that have different tags but are exactly the same will end up resolving to the same thing, and so they don't get deployed as well. So we can. So a second deploy won't do anything effectively um, unless something's changed in the meantime, which is which is really handy because it means that we can. Um, start treating our collection of microservices as a whole thing rather than as individual services that we would... Uh, we looked at Red Badger Stack. We, um, so this diagram, which hasn't got any colors in it. That's really weird, because on my thing, it's got like lots of pretty colors. <laughs> it's really depressing. Um, sorry? How does it not have okay, colours? Sorry? Maybe the colours come next. No? No. Anyway, um, oh, it's a real shame because the maybe. <laughs> is it just because it's full screen? Are they there are no colours there either? Sorry? The project is just washed out. There is like a bit of colour. Is there? Anyway. Oh, yeah, there's more colour here. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Anyway, um, I'll have to tell you. It was there. It's okay, just push for it, it's a very interesting bug. Yeah, it is an interesting bug. Um, if I change that colour to like a d deeper one. Can we see it? Oh, right, okay. Yeah. He is big colours. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> right, so it doesn't really matter. Um, they, they effectively move from like a red to a sort of green as the confidence level increases across a build. But if you had like a, a continuous deployment into production pipeline, it might look something like this with micro platforms. So you pull from GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, or whatever, or Git, public GitHub um, onto, uh, say, for instance, Jenkins or something like that, and build the unit, build the Docker containers, get the base images from some approved registry, build them, run all the unit tests, run a static analysis, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can't get an image unless all the unit tests are passed. Once it's passed, it gets tagged with the single version across the monorepo. Then it gets pushed into a, a private registry, maybe ECR or something like that, um, so that it can be deployed. Um, we've got, we had our own private registry on here, didn't we? So that it can be deployed to um, a micro platform, and maybe you've got one micro platform for doing all your testing on, and maybe there's one instance of the application or one orchestration of all the services for each open pull request. And then um, the deployment is that three stage like pull by tag, resolve, and, and deploy by content digest. By digest. Uh, so we get the item potency. Um, this testing here in number six is probably. Um, like integration testing maybe with again, stubs or maybe it's um, outside like BDD style functional testing automated but it's all automated right um, and as we move from left to right our confidence and the, the quality of our software improves once we've got um, to this stage here we're fairly confident that we've got a release candidate so that release candidate is pushed into a proper registry like this is a registry of like release candidates. These are things that will get deployed if, if everything goes well. Um, still, there's been no human event intervention here at all. We've got to um, point number seven now where we pull it, uh, deploy it onto um, a UAT micro platform and maybe that's just got one instance of the application, not loads like this one does. Um, and it's there for um, humans to test um, and but basically just to there's a, we run a bunch of smoke tests, like synthetics, like a like a happy journey, a happy path through the application, just to see, to make sure that we've got connectivity to the right backends and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
and but it's very lightweight. Um, and then if it's if it succeeds there, we do the same into higher environments, potentially even production. And if nothing failed along that route, then it will end up in production, right? So that means we have to separate our releases out and put them features behind feature flags because we don't want we want some control over when our features are actually being released to end users, but the deployment just carries carries on and happens regardless. So sorry, that was a really pretty deep picture. Of it. Not anymore. Um, right, quickly then, um, let's have a look at some AWS stuff. So um, in that repo and provisioning in AWS, there is um, a bunch of Terraform scripts, which um, if we... Um, so I destroyed everything earlier. So, the, so basically what we've got in AWS at the moment in a separate account is um, a VPC with two subnets, a public subnet and a private subnet. Um, there's also three, and th across three availability zones, there's also um, three NAT servers so that the private machines can get out to the internet. Um, there's also a Bastion host so that we can get in just for the purposes of this demo, um, which we'll have a look at at the moment. So um, this is EC2 um, and in the instances, whoa, uh, there's the only thing that instance is running is the Bastion, SSH Bastion. And on the VPC, um, Anyway, there's a VPC with two subnets. So if I, I'm not going to do the Terraform plan, I'm just going to go straight in to do a Terraform apply. Does everybody use tele Terraform? Has anybody not used Terraform? Um, it's basically, you haven't used Terraform. <laughs> um, it's, it's basically just a way of um, automating provisioning of infrastructure in AWS, or actually in GCP, or anywhere. There's lots of providers for Terraform. Um, so that you can use it for, and it's like a DSL um, that you can just create. Sorry. Yeah, it's very similar to cloud formation. It's just I think it's a probably a little bit easier to work with. Um, so I can tell you, I can show you what these scripts look like. So um, in uh, provisioning AWS, so that that just says. Um, use this region and then the managers um, uh, there's a launch configuration here for each of the machines in an auto scaling group there's auto scaling group for the for the managers got a minimum maximum size for instance and then there's hooks in there that register themselves with the DNS server via SNS and all that sort of stuff so it's a fairly complex setup it actually looks a little bit like um, this, oh no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Imagine the PDF. Imagine the PDF. I, it doesn't matter. It's not really interesting. Um, right. So it this takes a minute or two because um, what it does is it creates um, an EFS mount to share tokens over. Uh, we could we could do it with S3, um, but it's a little bit easier just to read and write from a file system on the local machine. Um, and the machines also register themselves with DNS so that when a new machine comes up in an autoscaling group, it can find a manager to join the swarm with um, because the autoscaling groups are self-healing. So if a machine dies, you know, another one will replace it. Um, they can, we can also use it to scale the number of workers. So there's two autoscaling groups. The manager's autoscaling group is fixed at the size of three. Um, actually, Good point. I don't think it is. I don't think we've set any of them up actually to. Oh, manage count of one and work count of two. So we're going to get one worker, one manager, and two workers. We can increase that. Um, so this, I mean, they can be any size they want, but um, we won't probably want one, three, or five managers and up to a thousand workers. Um, and any second now, I promise you, this um, will start. Um, bringing some machines in, so actually we've probably got some already. No. 
It's got to wait until these, um, there we go, right. Right, 25 resources added. So we've got um, an auto scaling group, two auto scaling groups. Um, uh, one for workers with two instances and one with manager with one instance and these are just starting up now. When they start up, they're CoreOS based images and when we use CoreOS Ignition to um, effectively set off or to mount the NFS mount point so we can see the token and to kick the whole thing in. It has to do them in sequence so that um, so that we can we don't trample over it. You know, the first manager that starts up has got to initialize the swarm. Subsequent ones have got to join as managers. Workers have got to join as workers, um, etc. So, I know it takes a couple of seconds, but um, we should be seeing some machines come up. There we go. So we said one manager and two workers. So we've got our machines now. So if we go to the manager, if we put its IP address into um, my SSH config, I can jump through the bastion, which is here, um, with this proxy command, and we can SSH onto it. So the SSH um, to manager A, and we should um, be able to jump onto the manager. You wouldn't normally need to do this, but just, it's not ready yet, is it? Come on, come on, come on. AWS gets slower and slower and slower throughout the day, doesn't it? No. Uh, I thought it did. Ten zero fifty eight one nine two. Oh, here we go. Right, just being slow. Um, so I'm on the manager. If I do a Docker node ls, um, we can see our three nodes, uh, one manager, two, and two workers. Um, because we've got an SSH bastion, and because we can tunnel through that bastion, and because Docker is a client server thing, you've got a Docker client on your laptop, you've got a Docker server somewhere, right? There's also, there's also a Docker server on the laptop. Um, so if I, um, I can tunnel through um, the bastion using SSH tunneling um, and effectively tunnel a socket, a so the remote var and so docker dot sock, which is how the docker client and the server talk to each other, to a local sock of socket file here on temp file. And that, before I do that, though, I'm just going to remove the existing one because uh, otherwise it won't work. Um, so, okay, so that's created a tunnel and um, this temp docker sock is now pointing at the remote docker server through the tunnel, through the bastion to the SSH server. So if I um, export um, that as my docker host using a Unix socket, so this is now a Unix socket to tell me where the remote docker host is. So now when I do a docker node, ls here oh. what what have i done sorry all these things work don't they so let's just start this again do it so first of all can we ssh through um manager a Oh, well, have we lost network? Is that already on the manager? Yeah, well, you were already SSH'd in once. On oh, no, I'm in now. I'm in. I mean, it's just probably just a network thing, right? So um, if we come out, <laughs> um, we haven't got any jobs. So now we should be able to do Docker node LS and we should. Mm. Docker host is Unix temp docker.sock. That should work. It's trying to do HTTPS as well. 
Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. Okay, sorry. That's because I had some other uh, Docker variables. It was doing all the TLS stuff. Uh, right. So, so on my local, so my now now my local Docker client is pointing to the Docker server on the manager in AWS, and so we can see those three nodes again. So that's quite cool because now we're tunneling through. It means that we can use the same tooling we were using before as our Docker thing was local, right? I mean, it's just the same. It doesn't know any difference. So if we go back to that example directory, um, we can deploy um, our services. We don't need the slash dash dash update because we're not using any local thing here now. So if we deploy the services, um, it should deploy them to the remote thing. Um, so now if we do a docker uh, service ls, we should see, oh, um, oh yeah, we do, yeah, we do, absolutely do. Um, we need to tell it which form uh, we've got some, there's a, a docker underscore docker file, which, is ju which li effectively just lists out my targets, um, so it knows where they are. Right. Whew. It's not up yet. There's zero out of one replicas. Um, but it won't take, there we go, it's up now. So what we could do um, is, uh, so I had a load balancer in here with a target group. Um, called web, which had some targets which have now been, so if we add some targets, which are these two web servers, which are the worker nodes, and add those to target group. Just mean now that if I go to, so I've got, um, web dot, Microplatform dot red badger dot com. Um, actually, it's a visualizer, isn't it? Viz, I think. Oh. Do what? Do I? Do, oh, did I do web? Did I? Uh, well then, I'm glad someone's paying attention. Uh, viz web web edit add the servers. Does it take a while? How's the health check? Sorry? What does the health look like? Um, not all scaling groups, these two. Initial. Target registration is in progress. Refresh. Healthy. Re. Oh. So, what? I don't know. Five minutes? It's not bad, is it, really? So now let's deploy our application to it because we can. Um, so, <laughs> well, actually, so one of the things we need, we, we want to push to a different registry now because we're not pushing to our local registry, pushing to ECR. So I'm going to, um, um, must, yeah, here we go. No. So I want to set this as the registry. Because when we do a build, um, so build app, um, I want it to, it's gonna use all the cache things, but I want it to, ta I want it to tag those with the, with the right tag here, which is the ECR registry um, and the name of the service and then the ubiquitous SHA from the commit. So now we've built it, we can push it to the Docker registry. Um, and there may be instances in there already. Oh. Oh, uh, credentials. Hmm. That's because. Hmm. 
Natural store, Docker Country exit. Mm. I saw this earlier. This is new. <laughs> oh, mm. can't think what it is. Um. Hmm. I bet I can't. I bet I can't pull. Oh, it, have I not got my? It doesn't matter which docker. I'm I, I'm local docker. I can push. I should be able to push that race. So that pulled, right? Did it pull? Oh, uh, right. Let's try this again. It might work this time. I think it's because um, no. It try. There's uh, AWS Labs have got this. Um, Docker credential helper, which I've just been trying to play with. This is all new, just been doing it today. It's in a pull request. And it's not 100% right, but it was working earlier. Because um, I ought to be able to just um, just push this, right? Um, with the tag, which is there. Hmm. Um, have I got Docker host, Docker service LS? So we're still talking to the remote server thingy. Do you need to tag, you need to tag the images first? The build does that. Um, hmm, okay. Oh, uh, that probably is it. So if I unset docker host and then try it. Okay, that actually... Um, hmm. That's weird, though. Different sort of error now. Okay, no mind. Maybe we can't do this. We can't do this. Anyway, we've got the visualizer running in there. Um, we could get the app running in there quite easily. Um, if we uh, we can scale it actually, though, which is quite, which might be interesting. So, in um, if we put the workers up to three and the managers up to three, um, and then just do a. Um, provisioning, AWS, Terraform, apply. Um, we should see two more workers just suddenly appear. Oh, oh, two more workers and two more managers. Um, I can't understand why that wouldn't work. It's really bugged me. Um, connection refused. It's not because we're still tunneling. Let's kill this. I don't, I don't think um, that should have anything to do with it, though. No. No, I don't know. Um, so those machines take a few seconds to come up, but they should just suddenly appear. Uh, right, anything else? We're about done for time, aren't we? Um, Demo local, local demo AWS. Um, in the, I'll share these slides. Um, this is the, about the tunneling through there, just for everything. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> any any questions? I'm sorry, what didn't, we didn't get it working. Why do we call it micro platforms? Why do we call it micro platforms? Um, <laughs> uh, for microservices applications, I don't know, like smaller platforms rather than what great big massive shared platforms. Maybe instead of instead of thinking that we have to deploy one little tiny application to a massive great big platform and share it with everybody else in the world, we could just have our own and manage it our own, manage it within a cross-functional team, um, help 
helps the, the team become much more autonomous and in control of their own destiny because they're managing everything. It's a good thing. I love, I love all the ideas that you've shown. And there's a lot of focus on Docker Swarm, and I was wondering, it seems like all the same ideas would apply to Kubernetes or something similar. Is there Absolutely. any reason why you would Swarm? Or? Uh, Abs absolutely. Um, in fact, Docker announced, I think, at the um, conference last week that. Uh, oh, the, sorry. The question was. <laughs> this is the signal he does this. If I haven't repeated. The, the question was, could we use Kubernetes instead of Docker Swarm, and like, why? Why one or the other? Um, and there isn't really. I, I mean, they're both great, right? Um, and at the conference this week, Docker um, announced that they're going to support both of them in. Anyway, so um, there's a whole load of new tooling which will probably make all this stuff from Red Badger Stack obsolete because, which is great, right? Um, don't mind throwing it away at all. Um, which will allow you to run either a Docker and Swarm mode cluster on your laptop or a Kubernetes cluster on your, app, on your laptop or from within the, by using the Docker client. So I think that the Docker machine stuff is going to go and I think that they're, they're just basically going to smooth all that out and make it a lot easier to use either. And so then the choice becomes, well, do you know Kubernetes already? Do you know Docker in Swarm already? I think the cognitive load around Docker in Swarm mode is much, much smaller. So I think a team that isn't like, there's, there's fewer moving parts and fewer bits to it. And I think the concepts are slightly a little bit easier. I think Docker have done a good job of like distilling all the best parts of what a platform is, like service discovery, secrets management. We didn't look at the secrets, never mind. Um, and you know, all these, all these things into something that's really simple and easy to use. So I think it's easier to get going, but um, maybe not as good in production and maybe it's not as solid yet, it's still changing quite rapidly. So there's a little following from that. One of the things that makes Kubernetes less scary to my team is the fact that I know I can get managed versions of it in these two clouds. So like if it's conceptually more complicated, but a lot of that complexity is managed by a third party, is that less scary? So you're talking about like GK? Yeah, like right. Google and Azure, and hopefully Amazon at some point will do Kubernetes as a thing. As a thing. Yeah, so. Yeah. Repeat. Oh, so the question oh. is, <laughs> <laughs> um, Google, Google does Kubernetes as a service, effectively GKE, um, Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, and Azure and, um, and um, AWS will probably follow Right, because everyone's going that way. Great, right, if they do, let's use it. I mean, the fact that we can, I think it's more the concepts of like small platforms that you manage and they only, like the blast radius, something goes wrong, right, you're only affecting yourself. Um, and, and also the concept of being able to deploy the, your whole application as a set of microservices. Like typically, I guess in the old days, you'd have, old days, <laughs> before this, <laughs> before this you might have had, uh, yesterday. Um, <laughs> You might have had one microservice um, feeding two different two or three different applications, and you know the, the consumer producer prob versioning problem. But all, so maybe you've got two two now versions of that same microservice, but as a thing serving both these applications. So this is all about bringing bringing that like now there would still be two instances, but they'd be running with the application separately, regardless, even if they were at the same. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, instead of having multiple instances, um, you still probably got multiple instances of scaling, but I'm not explaining as well. Next question, sorry. <laughs> All right, um, if you had to build this kind of infrastructure kind of incrementally, what does it mean to you? Like, how would you go about it? Which aspects do you build first? What would you kind of put in place? Um, Pete. Sorry? <laughs> um, so the question is, if um, if you're doing this in a small team incrementally, um, which bits would you do first? How would you tackle it? And um, so I think um, I would first get to know Docker, play with Docker in Swarm mode, um, get get it running on your laptop, deploy stuff to it manually, but without using any tooling, basically just with Docker commands. Um, understand it inside out. Um, it's really easy. You can do it in a day. It's not much to it. Um, and then um, maybe have a look at that Rebadger stack stuff to see what's, what, the, what that's doing, dig into what the tooling's doing there. It's not doing a huge amount, really. It's just um, 
make it making it easier to fit into a CI CD pipeline with the sort of build, push, and deploy steps. Um, I would play with Kubernetes definitely because it's like you know really hot at the moment and um, massively improved over what it was. Uh, what else? Any? Automate, automate, automate. Yeah, automate all the things. Hmm. Um, when you come to put it in production, would you do it incrementally, like part of your um, collection of services, or would you just do the whole thing and go and switch over? Because you, lo you lose that idea of having one version for all of your um, selection of services if you, if you do it incrementally, but that seems a little less scary. I don't think I follow quite. So like you come to the point when you want to start putting this in production, yeah. you can make a choice to move one of those services into this new lovely pure environment. Oh, uh, right. No, I thing. just do the whole thing. Because like, the, the whole point of this is to try is to allow you to work with your whole application yeah. as a thing, as a working orchestration that you've tested in all the lower environments, mm -hmm. and it's moved into the higher access higher by, by accident almost like it's almost like not, not a thing like the move from the highest pre-production environment to the low to the pr to production itself is not a step it's because it's the same they're all exactly the same and you you want to know that everything works together as a as a unit so that's what that's what i think anyway Actually, what? if you wanted to regress out of let's say if you um want to add a feature and then pull it out again then would you manage that one shell libraries as well or how would you go backwards yeah, it's a really good question, actually. So let me show you. So, um, pardon? The question is, how do you roll back, basically? Um, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a problem, um, if I, um, if I point my Docker client back to the swarm. So now, if I do a Docker node ls, I should see my fourth, and a service ls should see those services that we deployed earlier, and they should still be, be there, right here. Said that wasn't working. Uh, um, uh, hmm. Okay. Um, what you can do, you can to roll back. Um, it's literally Docker service um, dash dash uh, Docker service update dash dash roll back and the name of the service and it literally just it literally just um, rolls it back um, although we can't no I've, lo I don't know, I've lost it something wrong H3 with it sorry H3 yeah I think it probably has um, and it's like it just does a rolling deployment but backwards to whatever the previous version was. But it's just as easy to fix forward as it, well, often fairly easy to fix forward, so keep moving in that direction is better than going back, but for emergencies, yeah, for sure. Um, any other, sorry? Are there any other like, services, AWS or third-party services, you kind of consider like, essential for this? Uh, within AWS, any, AWS or other third-party? Um, are there any? AWS or other third-party services that you consider essential in? Yeah, I mean, like I say, this is the last. Um, so each of the cloud providers has their own set of native, cloud-native services, right? And you can go fully cloud-native, and you could use Google, uh, Google GKE or uh, Amazon ECS or you know any of, any of the container orchestration products that they sell. That they, but they, you kind of get sucked it in or vendor lock in and you then you want to move to a different cloud provider or you want to run it on your laptop quite often when you're developing cloud native applications you can only test them in the cloud and then it becomes quite difficult sometimes slow feedback loops and stuff um, so yeah I mean they all have, there's loads of services and lambda you know you could you could like the services that we were running there could easily run as lambda functions but then orchestrating them it's quite difficult um, you've got this big soup sea of functions and work, you know you lose that ability to be able to treat the whole thing like a monolith at a certain version which I think is quite important would you say that stack is incompatible with service architecture? 
No, I mean, I think, I'll, uh, so the question was, is uh, the mm, stack, which is, uh, can't stick, please, it's terrible. Uh, the great stack. Uh, so, no, I don't think it's incompatible. I think, I just think that eventually, like, everything will be serverless, because why would you manage your own servers, and like, why would you even bother with any of this? Um, but I think at the moment it's, um, and it's great, we've built serverless applications that are completely serverless. But I think as soon as you've got more than a few microservices, managing them is a nightmare. Like it's so difficult because um, it's just like one big bucket of functions, and there we, so you've got just the name of the function to kind of categorize, you know, sort of like, and how do you control orchestrations of those and make sure they're all deployed idempotently? And also the fact that, you know, you, you could suffer from cold start times quite, quite badly if you've got a Java application uh, service that takes 40 seconds to start up. I mean, it's like, so I don't know. I think, I think if they sort of so solve the cold start problem, I think one of the, I think web tasks are now cl claiming that they don't have cold start. It's an all zero product, serverless product. Um, so, you know, they eventually solve the cold start problem and they'll, and they're tooling around orchestrate, you know, managing orchestrations of serverless functions will come and then it'll be a no brainer, I think. But, I don't know, at the moment it's a bit difficult. It gets messy really quickly. This is, this is what all this, I think, is trying to solve is like things descending into a complete mess. Like when you've got so many different versions of so many different services in so many different environments with so many different configurations and it just becomes like, oh, go away. You don't want, um, and this is like, how do we get some of the simplicity or the, some of the simplicity that we had with monoliths back? We treat the whole thing as a, just an idea. What we didn't do was look at a rolling deployment of like an update and zero downtime deployment. So I was gonna change some code and change and show it to you, but I've seen it all before anyway. It's not much. Time, yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That's really good, thanks.